This video is brought to you by Squarespace. What is up Solo Cups? My name is John Solo and this is Messed Up Origins, the show where I take the tales you know and love from childhood and shed light on their messed up origin stories. Sometimes they're inspired by much older tales that are filled to the brim with violence and tragedy, so exactly the kind of thing you want your kids to be exposed to, and other times they're based on horribly depressing real world events. Well today's subject has a healthy balance of both, and that's because for the first time in almost three years we're exploring a story contained in Rudyard Kipling's the Jungle Book. Now to clarify, I'm not talking about the adventures of Mowgli and Baloo. We covered that back in September of 2018, though I would love to dissect it again at some point while still wearing the same shirt, of course. No, instead we're talking about the second most popular tale that book gave birth to, Ricky Ticky Tavi, the mongoose who single-handedly fought a war against the cobras who were determined to murder his foster family and turn their garden into their new kingdom. I've got to say that as far as fables go, this one might be one of my favorites that we've covered. Not only is Ricky amazing in his role as the guardian of the garden, but just like with Mowgli's adventures, Kipling's way with words makes the story come alive in a way that you just don't find with other folk tales. He manages to pull those ancient archetypes that lie deep within our psyche and resonate with our souls right to the surface with his unique cast of characters and the conflict they all find themselves in. And while I know you're excited to dive right in so you can see exactly what I'm talking about, I first gotta say thanks to the folks who made this episode possible, Squarespace. As you guys know, I've been partnering with Squarespace for years now, and that's because they truly are the best at what they do, which is give creators like me, you, and plenty of others in our community all the tools we need to make a stunning website that supports our business or passion project. Using their amazingly intuitive interface, I was able to build MessedUpOrigins.com out of practically nothing. There you'll find links to video playlists, several galleries of artwork created special by the Solo Fam, a tier list of all our folklore-based episodes, and even a page where you can buy my favorite resources I use in my research. And if you're thinking that any any of this looks complicated, trust me when I say that if it were, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But Squarespace makes the process super simple with their easy to understand design tools and award-winning customer support team that's available 24-7, not to mention there are dozens of beautiful layouts that you can choose from to make that starting line a lot less intimidating to approach. How easy is Squarespace to use? So easy that you could probably sign up and make a fully functioning website before this video's even over. So if you're in need of a website, why not give it a shot? All you gotta do is sign up for your free trial at squarespace.com slash John Solo. Then when your masterpiece is ready to go public, use code John Solo to save 10% off your first purchase. And on that note, we are ready to jump into it. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already and brace yourself for the messed up origins of Ricky Ticky Tavi. So if you're anything like me, you were introduced to Ricky Ticky Tavi by watching the animated Chuck Jones movie that was released in 1975. And if you're watching this video, you probably want to see how it compares to Kipling's version. That was me when I started my research. I vividly remember watching it in sixth grade as we were headed towards a holiday weekend and thinking, Dang, we're watching a movie in class that doesn't actually suck? What are the chances? Well, part of the reason the movie is so good might have something to do with it following the source material almost exactly. No exaggeration, almost every single line of dialogue, including the narration, is taken directly from the story. And it's for that reason that I don't feel inclined to do a recap of the short film. There are more things to find out about this house and yard, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. Instead, I'm just gonna dive right in and break down Kipling's version while simply highlighting the biggest differences with the animated short as I go along. Then we'll talk about his various sources of inspiration for the work, from the original ancient fable about a cobra-killing mongoose to his traumatizing childhood experiences. So starting from the beginning, like the rest of the stories in the Jungle Book, this one takes place somewhere in India. We have the entire plot spoiled for us when Kipling decides to give us the outcome of the conflict before we even know the conflict exists, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip that and introduce our protagonist. His name is Ricky Ticky Tavi, and he's a mongoose that was whisked away from his parents when a summer flood washed him out of the burrow where they lived, and after almost drowning, he wakes up in the garden of some humans. The son initially wants to have a funeral for Ricky, but the parents 
parents point out that he's not dead yet, so instead they take him into the house where they wrap him up in a towel and warm him over a little fire. After he recovers a bit, Ricky gets extremely curious, which as Kipling explains is why it's so hard to frighten a mongoose. They're more curious than anything else. He climbs all over the table, jumps on the little boy, whose name is Teddy, and starts exploring the property pretty much immediately. See, Ricky decided right away that he'd stick around the human's house because there was more to discover there than his whole family could find out in their entire lives. And after all, it's every proper mongoose's dream to one day be a house mongoose. So he spends the day exploring and getting into trouble. He almost drowns in the tub, sticks his nose in ink, burns it while sniffing the father's cigar, and after a long day of adventuring, he falls asleep alongside Teddy. Initially, the boy's mother, Alice, who shares a name with Kipling's own mother, is worried about this, but the father assures her that he's safer sleeping with Ricky than without, especially if a snake were to get in. That is what we call foreshadowing. The next day, Ricky explores his new hunting ground, aka the garden, then comes across Darcy the tailor bird and his wife crying in their nest. He asks what the problem is, and they say their baby fell out of the nest and was eaten by Nog, a five foot long black cobra who takes the opportunity to introduce himself after hearing his name. At first, Ricky was intimidated because he'd never met a cobra before, but his mother had fed him dead ones, and therefore he knew that a skilled mongoose was perfectly capable of killing and eating them. A little detail that I I love is that Kipling says Nog knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Next, Nog tries engaging Ricky in an ethical debate, a bit that's left out in the movie. He basically asks him, if it's okay for you to eat eggs, why can't I eat baby birds? Before Ricky can answer though, Darcy's wife calls out that Nog's wife, Nagina, is right behind him, and without turning around because he knew it would waste too much time, Ricky jumps in the air to see her lunge right where he was. At this point, he was ready, albeit afraid, to take on on both snakes at once, but they disappeared into the tall grass. Now for those curious, the names Nag and Nagina are a reference to the Sanskrit words for male and female snake, which are Naga and Nagini respectively. And yes, I think it's safe to say that JK Rowling naming Voldemort snake Nagini is a reference to this story, otherwise Sanskrit would be a pretty random language for her to pull from for the sake of one character. Soon after this interaction, Teddy approaches Ricky to pet him, but a dusty brown snakeling named Karate, who is even more dangerous than the cobras due to his size and speed, emerges from the nearby bushes. Teddy freezes with fear, but not for long as Ricky attacks the new threat and sinks his teeth right into the back of his head, paralyzing him. He was going to eat the petrified pest, but he knew that if he had a full stomach, he wouldn't be able to fight any other snakes. So instead, he left the job to the father, who beat the mostly dead monstrosity to death with his stick. In the movie, we're spared from this last bit of gratuitous violence. We're shown the father running to Teddy when he calls out for him, but the stick only ends up being used to throw the snake's body on the garbage heap. Now we fast forward to that night. Ricky's doing a security sweep around the house when he runs into Chuchundra, the muskrat, who Kipling describes as a broken-hearted little beast that whimpers and sheeps all night, trying to make up his mind to run into the middle of the room, but he never gets there. Kind of like me when it comes to doing any kind of social activity or posting something personal on the channel. I really do want to sometimes, but that tiny voice in my head says, nah, people have had enough of you, so instead I sit and cry in a hole like Chuchundra. Anyway, the muskrat tells Ricky that he's nervous the snakes are going to mistake him for a mongoose and come after him. Ricky says not to worry because the snakes stay outside, but Chuchundra tells him to be quiet and listen. Then the mongoose hears the faint sound of snake scales sliding on brickwork and runs into the bathroom looking for them. He hears Naga Nagina talking through the bathroom sluice, an opening in a wall that bathtub water is drained out of, and they discuss their plans to kill the humans so Ricky will leave and so they can be king and queens of the garden again. An interesting little detail they gloss over in the movie is that Nagina really wants to kill Ricky, but Nag knows that taking him on is way too risky, so they settle on the idea of killing the family instead. Ricky watches from above as Nog enters the bathroom through the sluice, then coils himself around the base of the jar of water that's used to fill the tub. His plan is to attack the father when he comes in for a bath the next morning. But not if Ricky has anything to say about it, he stays as still as death while Nog falls asleep, and after pumping himself up slash reminding himself to be cautious, he jumps on Nog and sinks his teeth right into the back of his head. This causes Nog to thrash about wildly, slamming Ricky into every surface he can, from the tub, to the counter, to the window, to the 
wall, but Ricky only tightens his grip despite his body feeling bruised and broken. He knew that he could very well be beaten to death, but he decided that, for the honor of his family, he preferred to be found with his teeth locked. A quote that I find to be incredibly metal. Suddenly, he hears a thunderclap and red fire singes his fur. The big man had just fired both barrels of his shotgun into Nog, ripping him into pieces. He and his wife Alice express appreciation for Ricky, who saved all of their lives within the span of a single day, and Ricky crawls back into bed with Teddy and makes sure that his body isn't really broken into 40 pieces before falling asleep. Now the next morning comes along, Ricky runs outside to do his routine sweep, and he runs into Darcy, who's flying around singing about the death of Nog, which the whole garden was already informed of because his body was on the garbage heap. What's funny is that the song he sings in the movie can actually be found in the book. Kipling included multiple extra chapters containing the songs and chants that various characters belt out in his stories. Ricky was irritated by this singing pretty much immediately though, when he asked to ask Darcy three times where Nagina currently is, before before being told she's mourning for Nog on the garbage heap. Seeing an opportunity, Ricky then asks where her eggs are and enlists Darcy's wife to distract Nagina while he sneaks into her nest and smashes them all. The little ladybird lands by Nagina, crying out that her wing is broken, and the snake says she picked a bad spot to be lame. But Darcy's wife refuses to even look in Nagina's direction because any bird who makes eye contact with a snake freezes with fear. Meanwhile, Ricky tracks down Nagina's eggs and smashes almost every one, which is 25 in total, something the movie doesn't specify. I'm not sure if they just thought it was excessive to go into that much detail about how many snake babies Ricky is straight up murdering, but it shows you how urgent the situation really was and how bad it could have gotten if our hero wasn't there. At this moment, Darcy screams that Nagina is in the house, so Ricky grabs the only egg he didn't smash and runs inside to see the family of three sitting stone still while Nagina sets her sights on the boy. Luckily though, Ricky distracts her with his taunts. He not only tells her that he's the one who killed Nog, as opposed to the big man with the fire stick, he also brags that he crushed 24 of her 25 eggs and he'll smash the last one if she doesn't turn to face him. Upon hearing this, she finally gives into his taunts and the father takes this moment to yank Teddy closer toward him. Meanwhile, Nagina pleads with Ricky to give her the egg and in exchange, she'll never come back. He responds that she won't come back because she'll be dead on the garbage pile just like her dumb old husband. Husband. Then she lunges at him and the two engage in a dance of death that leads to her stealing back her egg and trying to run away. Ricky wouldn't give up that easily though. He chases Nagina across the entire garden, sinks his teeth into her tail, and even when she ducks into the rat hole that her and Nog lived in, he doesn't let up even though it means he'll be at a disadvantage. After Ricky disappears into the hole, Darcy waits about five total seconds before deciding that he must be dead now and starts to sing a song of sorrow to mourn him. But just as he got to the saddest part, Ricky emerges covered in dirt and dust. The widow will never come out again, he says, and he was right. Then the coppersmith, a little bird that Kipling describes as the town crier of the garden, makes the announcement for all to hear. The birds and frogs all start singing with cheer. Meanwhile, Ricky saunters back to the house with his mission accomplished. His foster family expressed the greatest appreciation for the mongoose, who finally allowed himself to stuff his face and enjoy the moment. And from that point on, he continued to defend the garden until all the snakes in the jungle knew not to show their faces inside its walls. So that was the story of the Great War Ricky Tiki Tavi fought single-handed against the Cobras. And like I said earlier, Kipling found his inspiration for this epic tale in more than one place. In addition to his life experiences, which we'll touch on in just a bit, the idea for a story about a brave mongoose taking on dangerous serpents in a battle to the death came from an ancient Indian fable called the Loyal Mongoose and can be found in a collection called the Panchatantra, a name that means the five treatises in Sanskrit. The Panchatantra is a collection of interrelated animal fables that, like the many others we've talked about, are contained within a frame story. This particular frame story follows three ignorant princes who need to be taught valuable lessons which are explained in fable form. Now, something really interesting I learned in my research is that collections like this are considered part of the Mirrors for Princes genre and were often written when young and inexperienced rulers came to power. You can almost think of them as royal self-help books that were meant to impart wisdom and knowledge to the young princes who didn't have enough life experience to make 
make the difficult decisions that were expected of them. And I don't know about you, but I personally found this really interesting because while many of the stories contained in these books were shared orally and were therefore well known even among the common folk, the only person who would have access to all of them and therefore all of the knowledge and wisdom they contain would be the royals whom the collections were written for. The Pancha Tantra specifically dates back to around the year 200 and as you may have been able to infer from its name, contains five volumes of stories, each with a specific theme. The loss of friends, the winning of friends, war and peace, loss of gains, and the one our story is featured in, ill-considered action. So the way this story starts is by introducing us to a Brahmin and his wife who, for some reason, decided to raise a mongoose alongside their son and treat them both pretty much the exact same way. And I do mean exact. She gave the mongoose her breast milk, used her best healing ointments on him, gave him baths, etc. Despite all this though, she still didn't trust him and often thought to herself, the mongoose is a nasty creature. He might hurt my boy. One day, the mother goes to fetch some water from a nearby spring and on her way out, she tells her husband to watch over the boy so the mongoose doesn't hurt him while she's gone. But as soon as she left, the father went off to go beg for food. Not long after this, a black snake enters their house and looking for a delicious snack, crawls towards the unattended baby's cradle, only what the snake doesn't expect is for the nearby mongoose to go into big brother mode. Sensing the snake to be a natural enemy, the mongoose pounces on it and they do battle in the middle of the room. And the battle ends with the mongoose ripping the snake into pieces and tossing those pieces far and wide. Delighted with his own heroics, the mongoose runs to his mother while still covered in the snake's blood to show off his achievement, of course, but she totally misinterprets this and thinks he ate her baby. So you wanna know what she does? Instead of lavishing the mongoose in praise and pets like he expected, she takes her heavy jar that's filled to the brim with water and smashes it on his head killing him instantly. Isn't that just the saddest thing you've ever heard? Just imagine if that happened to poor Ricky Ticky. The mother rushes home immediately after killing her foster fur baby and finds that not only is her human baby safe and sound, but there are torn up chunks of snake all around the room. And she realizes she just murdered her son's protector and has a meltdown. At this exact moment, her husband comes home to show off the gruel he got from begging, really unfortunate timing, might I add, and she immediately flips out calling him greedy. And this is where the lesson for the the aforementioned princess comes in. She says, because you did not do as I told you, you must now taste the bitterness of a son's death the fruit of the tree of your own wickedness. Yes, this is what happens to those blinded by greed. For the proverb says, indulge in no excessive greed, a little helps in times of need, a greedy fellow in the world found on his head a wheel that whirled. So take that as a lesson, solo fam. Do not be greedy or your significant other will mistakenly kill your mongoose son. I've got a pen and paper if you wanna take notes. You were supposed to grab it. Now, as alluded to earlier, the Jungle Book contains multiple stories. In addition to the first three chapters about Mowgli and the fifth chapter about Rikki Tikki, there's also the White Seal, Tumai of the Elephants, and Her Majesty's Servants. Before being put in a collection together, the stories were first published in magazines throughout 1893 and 1894, with many of the illustrations being done by John Kipling, Rudyard's father. Each of the tales is also set in India, which may sound kind of random if you don't know the context, but Kipling was born in India and spent the first six years of his life there, though it does get a little more complicated after he turns six. See, when Kipling was a young lad, his parents left him in the care of foster parents over in Britain, a common practice back then for British families living in India and it was there that he spent the next six years of his life being abused by his foster mother, Mrs. Holloway. He details the experience in a story he wrote called Ba Ba Black Sheep, which I almost mentioned in our video about the nursery rhyme. It follows a supposedly fictional brother and sister named Punch and Judy after they're dumped on the foster home steps without much of a warning and discusses how Punch, meant to represent Rudyard, was bullied, beaten, and ridiculed by Mrs. Holloway, who considered him a deceitful little show off. There's even a part in the story that says he was treated so terribly that he actually wanted to murder his foster mom and kill himself. And that if it weren't for his yearly trips to his aunts during Christmas time, he probably would have acted on those feelings. His only other escape from miserable reality was reading books or being told stories by some of the help in the foster home, which is where he was exposed to tales like those in the Pancha Tantra. In that experience is where the inspiration for the Jungle Book's two most prominent themes comes from, abandonment followed by fostering and law and freedom.
freedom, with the former being the most present in Ricky Ticky's story. Just like Rudyard, Ricky was whisked away from the life he knew out of nowhere and was suddenly left in the care of total strangers. The obvious difference here is that Ricky ends up with a family that loves him, so they treat him in a way that encourages his natural strengths instead of torturing him for not behaving exactly how they want. In my opinion, they seem to represent the childhood that Kipling would have preferred over the one he got, and that naming the mother character after his own mother is no coincidence. After all, he describes the reunion with his parents as follows. Mother proved more delightful than all my imaginings or memories. My father was not only a mind of knowledge and help, but a humorous, tolerant, and expert fellow craftsman. He obviously thought a lot of them and no doubt wished he could have been fully raised by such respectable individuals. Now that other theme, law and freedom, doesn't really come into play with Ricky Ticky's story, but it is prominent in Mowgli's who struggled to follow both the laws of the jungle and the laws of man. His struggle to find a home where he fit in is said to represent Kipling's own identity crisis over whether he should consider himself more British or Indian. So I guess the moral of this story is, if you want your kid to be a good writer, damage them psychologically in just about every way that you can. Hans Christian Andersen would definitely back me up on this one. In all seriousness though, that was the messed up origins of Ricky Ticky Tavi. If you don't know, now you know. If you would be so kind as to hit those like and subscribe buttons to support the show and give us a little boost in the algorithm, I would greatly appreciate it. Also make sure you follow me on social media to stay updated on messed up origins news and see what topics are coming up next. And of course, follow my favorite little man cub, Gunther. He's not quite as good of a security guard as Ricky Ticky, but he does make an excellent vacuum. I'll be seeing you all again next Thursday in another episode of Messed Up Origins. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.